All right, friends and neighbors, welcome back for another networking video. This time we're going to be working with DNS namespace and resource records. There's a lot to talk about, so we're going to do this in two parts. Now, before we get started, there's a lot to DNS, a lot of things to remember, a lot of terms and stuff like that, but it really all comes down to this tree right here. So obviously the tree is much larger than what we're showing here. I mean, much, much larger. But as we go over terms, if you start to get a little lost or if we start to forget what we're really all about, just bring your brain back to the tree. So some key items here is that every level in the tree has to be identified, has to be part of the domain name. So we work our way from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom, whichever makes more sense to you. You have a label for each spot and that we've got to acknowledge all of these, these layers. So if you watch the video on the DNS build, you realize that the, the data for a particular domain is stored inside these files. And so now if you expand this to include the entire tree, well, there's a whole bunch of servers with similar files, right? So our forward and reverse lookup files or our zone files. And these are the master files kept by every administrator of a particular domain. Together, they constitute the entire system, but there's no one place where all of the records exist. We just do something called delegation, where each level of the tree has a server or servers handling a particular domain. Now, each domain name uniquely identifies a node, and if we didn't have the whole thing, we couldn't uniquely identify whatever that resource is. And so the, the fully qualified domain name is really, really important. Although we can use shorter ones or shorter names at various parts of the tree. Now the assumption is that when you have a fully qualified domain name, or if we're just talking about a name, right? Then somewhere there's a resource record associated with that particular node or resource. And that record will have a particular kind of data and importantly everybody's going to do it the same way so no matter what i'm looking up there's going to be records and records of the same type will have the same kind of information so another way to think about the domain namespace is that tree or the tree represents the domain namespace and each node has a label associated with it so every time you go down a layer you're going to add a label and then when you finally get to the, the end host or the resource that you're trying to reach, you've got this collection of labels that go together. And there are some limits on, of course, the size of that label. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So the domain name is really this collection of labels that we put together and they're just uh, separated from each by, by a period or a dot. Now ending with a dot is you saying, this is the fully qualified domain name. Now, relative names are sort of a part of that. And this is very similar to what we see in file systems. So, you know, if you're on a Windows system, you might begin uh, a, full, a full pathway to a particular file or something that was C colon backslash and then everything. So if you list all of that, that's the absolute path name. If you're on Linux, it begins with a slash, right? So we, we put a slash and then we put slash etc slash whatever it is. Um, and so if you include the whole thing, then that's the absolute path. But if you just pick the file name or maybe the directory above it and then the file name, well, that's relative. And you can re repeat relative names all over the place. We can repeat relative names or domain names all over the place. But the thing that uniquely identifies it is when we have the absolute pathway. So at the root of the domain name system is the dot, right? It actually doesn't have a name. It just starts up there and then we begin with each layer. And you might say that the root of a file system might be slash or C colon backslash. Now we do have this idea of the tree and then maybe subtree, so a part of the tree or a domain and then a subdomain. So if something lives inside a domain, it's considered a subdomain of that. And you can only reach the whole thing by going through what we might call the parent domain to get to the child. So there's just another way of thinking about it, right? The whole thing is the tree. 
the namespace tree. So everything is the tree. If you're talking about a particular domain or a particular set of domains, the .coms, the .edus, the .govs, well, that would be a subtree or maybe branches of the particular tree. And then when you finally get down to the individual resource or node that you're after, we might call that a leaf off of the tree. Now, when we include everything all the way up to the top, we call that a fully qualified domain name. And that's what we're talking about. And that is where we have no ambiguity between the resources. There's no way that two things can have the same fully qualified domain name. Now, as we talked about in the sort of DNS big ideas videos, before we can you know, manage all of these domain names and before we can come up with the resource records that identify what kind of resource something might be and the information that's contained there, we have to have that convention. And that's what's really, really well established. So we've got this particular structure and particular way of naming things within the domain name space, within the domain name tree, and all of those labels going all the way down to the individual resource. And everybody does it the same way. And the files that contain the information are structured in the same way as well. So all of that, all of that set of information, all of the details are the same for everybody. Now the information that we use or the information that we put inside those files are called resource records. And there are different kinds of resource records. Um, and so each one of those will be selected for a particular resource. So for example, if we're doing a forward lookup, we want an A record. And that's just an address record and everybody does it the same way. If we're going the other way around, we might do a pointer record. And that's where we saw the, uh, the in address.arpa uh, file naming. And this is what we saw in the, the demo build that was part of one of the previous videos, right? We saw the, all of these things in the zone files and everybody has to do it the same way. And so when you run things like check zone, it's looking for that format and that structure. Now this is just a little bit more about the tree itself. So we have the top of the tree, right? We call that the root. And I suppose if we drew this the other way around, it might make more sense that the roots are on the bottom. And then what we have at the top are the top level domains. So .edu, .gov, .com, those are all of our top level domains and .nets, so there are a whole bunch of them. Below that, we have the second level domain. And so that's where you see there's a couple of examples here. So RIT is www.rit.edu or the domain is rit.edu. So obviously we fall under the top level domain of .edu and then our second level domain is RIT. But within RIT and within most organizations, there might be subdomains or other organizational structures that are part of the tree that are under that second level domain. And so this is very, very common. So I have a couple of examples down there. So I work for uh, GCCIS, and so we are a subdomain within the RIT domain. And you could not get to a, a resource within GCCIS without first going through RIT. Now this is a little bit more of the same thing, right? This is just saying in words what we just saw in sort of that list. But another important detail on this particular slide is that you have to register. So when I create a subdomain, right, if I, so in the demo, I did bruce.com. But if I didn't tell anybody above me within the .com address space that I was creating this domain, right, nobody would be able to get to me. Nobody would ever know, and I could never be the authoritative name server. The same would be true if inside RIT, I created bruce.rit.edu and didn't uh, register that domain with the layer above me. And so if RIT didn't know I was there or didn't approve of the DNS, then there would be no way for me to resolve things above me and no way for folks to get down to the subdomain. So that's, that's really important. But once you are registered, then you are the administrative control of that domain or subdomain. So as we saw again in the demo, I created an authoritative name server for a particular zone. And then I also had the reverse lookups for that zone. Now normally what you would have in a zone is you would have the authoritative name server and then hopefully a backup or a, uh, another name server that was supporting you. That doesn't mean that you can't run with one name server, right? And then that name server is somehow 
registered with the namespace above it. And so we have to have a way to, to do lookups above and below us and pass things off to other name servers. Without registering, that doesn't happen. And another related name for that is delegation. Now, one other fun note is that a name server can also be authoritative for more than one zone. As you saw in named.conf, you can make a definition for a particular zone, but there's nothing that says that you can't create other zones in that file as well. And as I've said many times, the whole system is distributed. Now, you could say that, well, the root servers, right, they're sort of centralized, and that's true. But the minute we have a, a domain that's registered or we delegate authority to that domain, well, that domain is now under the control of an administrator that has full rights and responsibilities for that particular domain and the name server and all the editing and everything else that happens there. So way up at the top of the tree, the root servers have limited knowledge, right? And down at the bottom end of the tree, domain name servers have limited knowledge, right? They know a lot about what their domain is doing, but they know very little else about the rest. And that's actually kind of cool. It is not only a way to survive problems when there's an issue associated with DNS or an attack of some kind, but also it spreads the load amongst all of those those name servers. So the performance would be much, much better in this de decentralized system as it would be, or as compared to if it was all centralized. So as I said earlier, there are some rules, right? Each layer needs a label. So a fully quality domain name is this sequence of labels. Now each label is limited in size, right? You can't just create these enormous labels, individual labels, and there's a limit to the overall length to the full, fully qualified domain name. And of course, now we know that the fully qualified domain name is the list of all labels. And in a lot of zone files, we indicate that by putting on at the, at the end of it. Now at the bottom here, I've got an example of a fully qualified domain name versus a relative name. So that name first class could be used, that used to be our mail server. Uh, first class could be used in many other domains, right? But the thing that makes it unique is the fully qualified domain name. So the mapping that we have established with the tree is that we've got this fully qualified domain name that goes to one IP address and one only. Now, the interesting thing about IP addresses that's related to this, right? Very clearly, the domain name system is hierarchical. And by drilling down through the tree, you can get closer and closer to the destination. Now, you don't know where the destination is, uh, but we certainly have a, a clear identification of that particular host or, or resource. IP addresses are similar. IP addresses are hierarchical. And though you can't tell by looking at an IP address exactly where it is, we certainly know regions because certain blocks of IP addresses are administered by different uh, regional internet registries and then down to ISPs and then down to down to customers and that mapping between those fully qualified domain names and the IP addresses is really the whole point that's what we're trying to do now if we need to get to somebody else right some other IP address or some other domain name we know when we're a name server the name servers above us and we also know where all the root servers are because in a domain name system configuration for a server there is that root server's hint file, right? So all name servers know where the, where the root servers are. And then of course the reverse is also true, right? We wanna do this reverse mapping. So that's part of it, right? With both forward and reverse lookups, we saw that origin statement that tells us, well, this name goes with this domain and then the reverse is also true. This IP address goes with this, this uh, address space for, uh, for the domain as well. Now, the, the format for reverse uh, lookups is also, you know, sort of a little confusing. But if you think about it this way, if you think about a host name, a fully qualified domain name for a host, which side is the more specific? Well, the side that you start reading from is the most specific. But that's the opposite for an IP address. And so that's kind of some of the rationale behind it, right? What is most specific part of the address or name? compared to the other way around. Now, I guess uh, something I'll mention here, canonical names um, sort of 
throw the cards up in the air and say, well, I don't really have a fully qualified domain name that I want to use, or I, I don't want to reference this thing by an IP address, so I'm just going to call something this name. And then I'll rely on my name server to figure out who that name actually belongs to. And the example that I had in the build was Dr. H, right? So that was a canonical name that referenced something, and there was no resource record in the, no A resource record or no pointer resource record for Dr. H. It just had a C name entry. Now the demo build, it was an authoritative name server for that particular domain namespace. Okay, well to be authoritative, you have to be recognized from the domain above you. So you have to be registered with the domain above you. Otherwise, you can't be authoritative because nobody looks to you for the answers, right? Nobody even knows that you're there. So the second level domains, those are almost always some large enterprise and they are registered with the top level domain above them. And when you are a subdomain of some secondary level or second level domain, then you have to be registered with uh, the second level domain as well. So some other fun tree ideas, right? When you have a domain, sometimes we refer to subdomains as children. So we have the parent domain and then we have the, the child domain or the subdomains. And there is this relationship between them. So the children have to be registered with the parent and the parent has to know about the children in order, in order to get there. And that naming conventions within the two children domains or the child domains have to be different, right? You can't mix and match the pathway because the name resolution won't work. Now the canonical name thing allows us to point anywhere. So that's a little bit different, different animal as I was saying earlier. So CNAME can point to almost any resource anywhere. So the process of registration and delegation goes something like this, right? We have the top level domain and then you have the second level domains and those are all registered with the top level domain. You create subdomains and those have to get registered with the second level domain. But in order to become an authority, right, you have to be uh, recognized by the, the layer above. And so that layer delegates authority to your name server. And so that's kind of how it works. The minute you have authority, you're creating a new zone in the tree. Now, before we go much further, I want to recognize Ayana. Now, you know, I'm a big fan of RFCs and the discussion all throughout uh, this uh, series on DNS is really RFC 1034, 1035, 1033. So there's a collection of, of RFCs that go along with this. But a terrific resource and the folks that have all the information is IANA. So if you go out to IANA.org and take a look at the domains, you'll see all of this stuff listed there. So there's definitions for all the domains plus all of the root service. So do not lose sight of the fact that there are organizations that sort of run all of this, right? RFCs come from the IETF, but the Internet uh, Assigned Number Authority, well, that sort of indicates the stuff that they're in control with. So IP addresses, IP version 4, IP version 6. We've got the port uh, number registrations out there. And now you know that there's a lot of DNS goodness out there at IANA as well. Now, the tree has the structure of the top level domains and then the second level domains and then all of the subdomains. But the root servers, what do they do? What's their, their primary job? Well, they sit way at the top of the architecture and they know a lot about the top level domains and about the second level domains. They don't know very much about the domains below that. So the root servers have no idea about things that are going on inside RIT or, or something of that sort. They do know about RIT, but they don't know about, about what's going on inside RIT. So the root servers are there to back each other up and to provide this sort of top level information. So root servers are really kind of important to know and every domain name server has a list of the root servers as part of its configuration. Well, I think that's where we're gonna stop right there. I'm exhausted. This is a lot of detail. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about resource records, but this has been a discussion about the namespace. And as you can see, there's a lot to the namespace and understanding how it's structured. But hopefully we have a better understanding of the tree, the role of servers to handle the management of the, of the uh, tree and their particular domain or subdomain for which they are the authority. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Like and subscribe if I helped. And may your packets always be able to successfully navigate the tree on their way up and on their way down.